The Toronto Comic Arts Festival would like to honor and acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Wendat peoples. We are in a territory that was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon One Pump Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to share and care for the land. This land is also covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This acknowledgement is a reminder that we are all treaty people and that we have a responsibility to the land and each other. TCAF celebrates the long history of sharing stories on this land and is committed to increasing Indigenous voices and perspectives in our programming. Hi, my name is Fiona Smith and I'm TCAF's General Programmer. Join me and the TCAF team in listening to acclaimed cartoonist and creator of Ducks, Two Years in the Oil Sands, Kate Beaton, and graphic novel defender, Matea Roach, in conversation now. How are you? No, I'm good. Um, uh, there's the cover. <laughs> it was, uh, I didn't even do, uh, that was the, the first cover that I, I sent in and that ended up being it. It was very much the, the, the first vision. Um, and, uh, and it, it's, it's the, the two worlds that we're straddling and, and the note that kept coming up throughout was like, should we put more actual ducks in there? I was like, no, that's good. Just the two little ones in the distance. We don't need, we don't need, <laughs> we don't need to overstate the point. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's so funny because, you know, I don't think I've ever looked at the cover that closely before. Like I, it's just kind of, I, I don't look at book covers, I guess, that often, except for when I'm shopping for books. And I didn't like go buy this in a store. I, it was sent to me in the mail and I already knew mm -hmm. I was going to read it. Um, I really, it's a really good cover. I can see why they didn't make you draw multiple versions of it. Like, <laughs> or why it was kind of the concept um the sort of two worlds like this specific like rock formation in the back reminds me of like looking I don't know if there was a specific land feature that you were particularly inspired by but it reminds me of like looking at Cape Smoky from Inganish Beach is what it looks it's, like <laughs> it was freehand and it's not anywhere in particular but it is very Cape Breton a lot of the coastline looks like that that steep drop off off of something um, and a lot of like hiking trails and, and um, I think I had just gone back from uh, like a, um, a drive or, a, or something where I, I had seen something like that recently. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's a very familiar to anybody who's gone, even around the Cabot Trail or something like that, everything looks like that up in the north end of Cape Breton, especially. Yeah, the, the north of Smoky region, as they say, where there were no roads, apparently, when my grandfather was born. This is what he always says. He's like, when I was a kid, there was no road. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. And they've been slowly expanding the road ever since. They've made it a lot more tourist friendly. Um, even yes. even like in the past couple years since I learned to drive. Even then, uh, it's always getting washed out. The hurricanes keep washing that area out because it, it seems to be very road averse <laughs> yeah it's like the land doesn't want roads to be on it or even like aside from washouts I was saying to a friend yesterday I feel like there are a lot of things that I'll explain to people that have like only ever lived in Toronto or big cities and they're like no that's what you're talking about it's not real but just the fact that like during the summer anytime you drive around the Cabot Trail there's going to be like a solid stretch of road where they'll be doing road work on one side and you have the guy with the sign there that's like stop or slow and you'll sometimes just have to wait 15 minutes like sitting in your car because half the road is being worked on because there'll be these giant like you can't even call them potholes like the road will just start sinking into the <laughs> ground and they have to pave it over again that's year round that was that happened to me yesterday <laughs> dropping uh my my family like my husband's family they're all from alberta and the roads there are so straight they all get seasick driving here because the roads go like this it's, <laughs> it's funny like i wonder in alberta i know in australia apparently because the roads that go through the interior of Australia are just like so long and so straight. 
um, they deliberately put curves in the road that aren't really needed to keep drivers alert so that you can't just zone out. I wonder if they do that in Auburn. Right. Roads are really like you can see for just miles and miles. In my experience, no, you just drive for miles and miles. But somebody might correct us on that now. Somebody from Alberta might be like, no, there is a there's a bend, a bend that keeps you awake. Yeah. I'm not, but uh, I know that uh, uh, my my sister in law will drive from uh, from where they live in Carolina, Alberta, to where her husband lives in Saskatoon, and there are five turns the whole way, which makes me makes me scream internally because I can't imagine. I can't imagine like a like a, a five hour drive with five turns. Hey, yeah, I feel like I would get bored. I, I would zone out um, a five hour drive with no turns and like no, you know, the, the prairies can be very beautiful. It's always interesting flying over and you can see like so distinctly the, you know, where one sort of field with one crop ends and another like gigantic area begins. And yes. that's very interesting, but that I don't think it's as appreciable driving through it. That's something that you can see much more easily from the air, like kind of, wow, look how people have engineered the land in this way. And driving, it's just like, okay, that's fields. Yeah. And I think that three of those turns are like at the very end or very beginning, which is bananas to me. Also, if you go back to the second slide, um, this might be something that you can speak more to than me, but um that house there, the half of a house, that mm -hmm. is very industrial Cape Breton. So and, this yeah. is actually really good that you bring this up after, when I was back in Cape Breton over the holidays, I went to like Sydney, New Waterford area for the first time um, in years. Um, my dad's from New Waterford, like industrial Cape Breton, but since his mom passed away, we don't really, we don't really get up there anymore. Um, but my, my mom's dad was in the hospital in Sydney. And so I was like, okay, why don't we take a drive into Waterford and just see, see what things are like. And yeah, there's a ton of these like half houses where it was like a company house and one half of it was torn down or something or people moved. And the other half of it is just still there because it was different people living in that side and different ownership. Um, yeah. I don't know what a, a company house is. Uh, the company house was built by coal mining companies. And to, to do it sort of on the cheap, they would build one structure and to house two families. So one half of it would have one family and the other half would have another. Um, and, uh, and so uh, they, they would be in total different states of repair. And uh, so, so maybe one half would be structurally unsound and sort of fall down and the other half would be fine mm -hmm. and and a friend of mine from from uh sydney tells me that like when people would come to visit sometimes they would sort of take them around to see these places because they were so emblematic of industrial cape breton mm -hmm. yeah it's i don't know i think when i first read ducks it was like i hadn't been to that part of cape breton in a while and then now looking at this again after having just been there it's like of course yeah kind of much like the land features it's something that's very distinct and regional in I'm margaret's sure. museum she lives in one of these sorry in margaret's museum in the in the movie um uh, the main character they live in one of these don't they i think I have not, I, this is another movie I have to watch. There's all, there's all these like regional, <laughs> I haven't watched The Waterford Girl. I haven't watched Going Down the Road. Now I haven't watched The Waterford Girl either, but. Um, I think one of my dad's high school classmates produced it. There's some sort of, because of course, because can, Canada. Yeah. Is, <laughs> you know, Canada's so small. <laughs> yeah, and Nova Scotia is the smallest part of the smallest country in the world. <laughs> but it, it is like, uh, um, I don't know if you see them anywhere else in the same way where you're like, well, that's so Cape Breton. No, because I mean, company houses are certainly not unique to Cape Breton, but that specific build of company house, I mm -hmm. have it, it feels that way. So I, I felt like I had to put it there because, because of how local it felt. Mm -hmm. Even though I think some people are like, oh, that's like a, an over, I don't know. Uh, in some ways it's almost like, not poverty porn, but like some something like that. Uh, yeah, like kind enough. of essentializing it down to one thing when it's like, well, that's not everybody's experience. And like, right. but it but it is some people's experience, and you do see a lot of this. 
you do and and how unique it is to the area i still felt like i i that's an image that i i should put in and then the lighthouse let me think i think it's i think it's the old marguerite island lighthouse um and then later on uh the song and in the shy comes up and it's that is about marguerite island so um it's a it's a very uh sort of specific callback that that almost nobody will get <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking as we're describing this to you. I'm just like, I don't know that like, if you haven't seen one of these houses in real life, I don't know that you pick up why it's, I think maybe you would just think it's a weird angle or something. You wouldn't be like, oh, that's half a house. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's right. If you look at it, you might just think that I don't know how to draw houses. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to, you know, <laughs> middle school art and learn their perspective because the lines are acting <laughs> funny. <laughs> that I just can't figure out that's right now that I'm looking at it some people might think that I just don't know what I'm doing weird, narrow house. House. yeah <laughs> but if you if you look up half houses or half a company house or something you'll you'll see what I'm so you'll probably see the picture that I referenced honestly yeah well and even if you see a full one you can see oftentimes like you were saying like the very different states of repair or it's like completely mm -hmm. different siding and, and styling right because some of these houses are like 100 years old and have just been like the ones that are in good repair right and are quite historic yeah. but then the result yeah. of that is like you have completely different sets of people on each side making completely different aesthetic choices about their side of the house yeah we have them here as well in Inverness County uh in in the town of Inverness which was a coal mining town and you drive down Main Street and like one side of the house would be like peach colored and the other side would be blue and they would have different sized windows and stuff. It's very, it's very like unique. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, anyway, well, we can keep going through these. Yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, Kate and Matea's half hour about houses. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, this one, Eddie Coffey. I had a big conversation with, um, uh, Tom Power at, on Q about being the only book, uh, like best-selling book that referenced Eddie Coffee. <laughs> he's like this very like sort of strange Newfoundland singer who's very Newfoundland, um, and uh, some some Newfoundland singers have a. I'm not gonna like sing how he sings, but they have a very like they've got the accordion going and their their songs just like they're just so Newfoundland in a certain way and this Newfoundland hour was so funny in a place that we're, we're like you you take humor where you get it um it's like the the whole the whole work site went dead because everybody was sitting in their trucks with the truck going listening to the Newfoundland radio hour just having like a tear <laughs> for these songs these songs with accordions and and singing about like fishing and stuff <laughs> yeah. so it was like an hour on I guess a, a local station or what was um, local station yes that like uh you know the 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 strings would pop up and be like it's time for the Newfoundland radio hour and like everyone would be like Jesus I gotta get back to the track <laughs> uh just all work halts we got to listen to the radio for an hour yes and the other four men would be like i hate <laughs> i hate this show <laughs> not not a goddamn thing gets done when these guys are in their tracks listening to the fucking show <laughs> yeah 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 I, I, well and i guess like i remember there being kind of the one line some like Alberta you know some character some person who's from Alberta being like well if you, if you all want to go home so badly like why are you here like why are you crying listening to the radio yeah about new well you they would all a, a lot of people went there because they had to and and they hated being there and and they would get you know they would often shit talk Alberta and how much they they didn't like being there and and people who are actually from Alberta would get their back up about it and be like, because because uh, uh, the people from out east or whatever would be like, this is a shithole and I hate it here. And like someone would be like, I'm from Edmonton. Like, shut up. <laughs> like, if you don't like it, there's the door. And you couldn't blame them for that because this was their home. Mm -hmm. And the way they saw it, like everybody from out east was coming and just like complaining all the time. 
and uh, but they were making lots of money. So mm-hmm. so like, what are you complaining about? Why why you know you don't have there's nothing back home. Like your your province is the one that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very the, you know, we're the economic engine. Like none of you would have mm-hmm. you would have no money, no food, no hope without us, I think as as far as certain people from yeah. Alberta concerned. So it's like uh I, <laughs> a line that I think um a guest that I had on my podcast one time, I can't remember, we were talking about something completely different. We were talking about like grocery prices or something, but she said like stay mad pours, uh, you know, imitating like the grocery CEOs. And yeah. I feel like that's kind of sometimes the Alberta attitude towards the East Coast a little bit is like, okay, well, when you want money, you come here and then all you do is complain. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's uh, it was very like the culture clash sometimes was was very like on the ground like mm-hmm. that. But for the most part, people people got along well because they were all in the same situation. Also, like if they were uh, like if you were from Alberta and you were working in the oil sands, you you were someone who who didn't have the the choice to kind of work in one of the better jobs like. The, the better oil and gas jobs in Alberta are not in the camps in Fort McMurray. There. No, it's like office jobs in Calgary and mm-hmm. Edmonton. It's, you know, a lot yeah. of people make their money that way. Yeah, or in or in one of the gas plants that's in like somewhere more south. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so there was still camaraderie there. Uh, it's just that they would get annoyed by by the whiners. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you could see their point. I mean, if somebody came here and was like I hate this place you'd be like shut what up you like you don't have to be here but you yeah. know it's, it's they kind of did have to be there and I think yeah you know any workplace too like any any time that you're in a an enclosed setting with the same amount of people you know tensions will start to come to a head and I imagine even more so <laughs> in a, a camp situation where yeah. you're not just working with these people but this is who you live around and you're you know, I think your schedule in the book there, you're working 12 days on two days off or something like that for, for a long chunk of it. Like, of course, there's going to be friction between people in the conditions. Yes. And it was often like, not just like where people were from, but just like specific personalities, like the most annoying people would, would just bubble up no matter where they were from. That's, that's, they would find you. (laughs) They would find you and annoy the shit out of you all the time like uh I, one of the one of the more interesting characters in the book is the one that I named Damien who was just a young kid and um and he annoyed everybody but he was only a little baby and and he was posturing all the time but but he was so young and he was trying to figure out how to be how to be like the like the grown men you know but all the grown men were such dirt bags and and that's you know he's trying to emulate what they're doing in the way that that kind of like little boys do and uh and you know you and and they were always picking on him and uh he's a very fascinating character study because uh because I would be like you have to be nicer to him he's just a kid and he's trying to learn how to be a man here and they were like oh he's fucked then He's fucked. And he was, he was because, because he was only surrounded by bad examples. Um, And he was 18 when I met him, Um, just a baby. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and you would see like glimmers of this, like really just like a child in, in, in him. And then, um, uh, and then he would say something that would just make you explode with rage because he was being such a little shit. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a lot to think about. Cause I, I was thinking about age, you know, while reading ducks and like, you go out there at the start of the book, you're 21. And I was thinking like, okay, I finished school when I was 21. My experience of finishing university was like, I graduated at the start of COVID. And so mm-hmm. it was like very bad in a very different mm-hmm. way. Where it's just like you, there was no like full-time jobs really to be found anywhere a lot of people that mm-hmm. I knew they're you know that were going to have these like fancy internships all their internships got canceled because yeah. no, one to, no one either wanted to or had the capacity to move it online and I just had to do this succession of like bad office jobs that would hire you for three months or six months or whatever mm-hmm. 
And it's like, I think back now and it was only three years ago. And I think about like how much better I'm able to deal with the problems of my life, even now at 24 compared to being 21. And then I oh, think definitely. when I started university, when I moved away from home and I was like 16 turning 17, I was stupid. I was a stupid little baby. <laughs> Yes. I don't know how to do anything. And I thought, I thought I was like a big adult because I had moved away from home and you know, it was okay. Like I managed, but looking back now, it's like someone should have called the child protective services on me. Like, yes, ready. And thinking about, you know, 18 year old boys, basically, cause you're pretty much still a boy when you're 18, you're like big oh, yeah. and angry and not settled into yourself yet. Going to this like hostile environment and having to grow up there essentially because the process of growing up doesn't finish when you leave high school or when you turn 18 or whatever like mm -hmm. ideally you're growing up until you die like basically ideally. yes new things it's like it's rough to think about it is it is and i i like at that time i was like this kid annoys the shit out of me and now i my like i have children i'm older and i'm like i'm like i feel so bad for him uh through like an older person's vantage point I feel I feel bad for him and um and I hope he's doing okay I know he's a father now mm -hmm. and uh and I'm like I I I feel like I hope he's grown and I hope that he's uh he's doing well I, I wish him well because I knew him as that as that young kid and he was very sweet in his own way even though like he was in this horrible place um and uh uh, and there were a lot of young men who went out there and, and, and were like too young to, to be in that, in that toxic place. Um, and I think that we all know here, we all know people who went out there and changed and, and were like, they came back and you're like, you're different in a way that I don't like. Um, like, uh, the, the best way to, to look at it is to like, like you read their Facebook posts and you're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's never, I think the fact of someone having Facebook posts at all to me is almost a red flag immediately. <laughs> <laughs> That's your generation. That, that is a generational difference. I think, yeah, yeah. People, people in their thirties and forties, I think, uh, seem to still post on Facebook because it's like people who didn't migrate over to other platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas like a lot of people that I know have deactivated Facebook entirely, or they, if they keep it, they only keep it for like event invitations and things like that, or to keep up with family members who are older and posting like photos of their kids and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you get the kind of like political screeds. Sometimes you see people start posting on Facebook and it's like, okay, something's gone off the rails at some point to get us. Yeah. yeah the, the, the politics go right wing. And, uh, and you're like, oh, what happened? <laughs> what happened to you? Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know where that, where that all comes from. And that's, that's newer as well. That wasn't really happening when I was there. Um, but uh, uh, also uh, what happened when I left 2008, a lot of my generation, uh, um, not when I graduated from university, but when I left the oil sands, um, you were saying you graduated when COVID happened, when I got left the oil sands, that's when, uh, the economy collapsed <laughs> in that 2008, like free fall. And that everybody was, uh, everybody was also losing their internships and all of their things. And, and, uh, nobody was unsure what to do. So, so I sympathize with that. Everybody who was like, it seemed like everybody was going back to school for no reason, because it would seem like the only thing to do. And for a lot of people, it was the wrong choice. Yeah. Um, if you look at like, and, and this is just anecdotally of, of things that I was applying to, you know, kind of 2021, when I was thinking I was going to go back to school, the application numbers, you would see these massive spikes in all sorts of graduate programs, the amount of people that wanted to get in. And I think it's because people are are scared of kind of that directionlessness and not knowing mm -hmm. what to do and where to go. And it's it's like, in some ways, it's kind of a champagne problem in the sense of if you have a BA, like probably you can figure something out, maybe if you're crafty mm -hmm. and, you know, you, you have a qualification, like I'm, I'm thinking about this in the context of 
people who go to work in the oil sands, like, I don't want to say that you were anomalous in the sense of having like a university education, but I have to imagine like the specific kind of university education you had couldn't have been that common. Um, having a BA, yeah. uh, I, a lot of people from where I'm from would get a BA and they would be teachers, mm -hmm. no matter what they were actually interested in, because being a teacher was seen as a safe job. Um, if, if that's what you mean. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of like going into like anything that could be considered trades, like it's relatively not that common, or maybe this is just like me being myopic of like, I know exclusively like the most type A like <sighs> nerds. I know a lot of type A neurotic nerds. And so it's like not people that would pivot to trades mm. when faced with like bad workplace conditions or an inability to get a job. The pivot is to go back to school, like pretty much universally. So I guess kind of what I'm wondering is like, were there many other people when you were out working who were kind of in your position of like trying to pay off loans, not really certain what to do for work, or was it mostly people that came from a trades background or came from kind of like a skilled labor blue collar background? Actually, you'd be surprised how many people were out there with, with arts degrees. Um, even uh, like uh, in the book, uh, Emily, who my, uh, I work with in Albion Sands. She had a folklore degree from mine. <laughs> we were told, she was like, she would laugh. She was like, everybody from Newfoundland has a folklore degree from mine. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds so cool. And she was like, yeah, but I'm here, like working with you. Uh, and uh, um, a few other people that worked in, uh, often they were in like the offices and stuff. And of course, Lindsay and Becky both had degrees and they were in there paying them off. Uh, and, uh, and, and there, there was more than, than you, than you thought. I wasn't, I wasn't that much of an anomaly, but, um, but compared to the people there with trades, definitely. Uh, there were a lot of people from my, my class, my area, who who went out there, who went and, and had had degrees, but they they're not in the book because there were so many jobs and they were so spread out that um, that they they could be working out there, but you'd never see them because they would be in a different camp and there were so many different camps and things. But uh, but they were they were far exceeded by people with trades and things. We there's actually in Cape Breton, I think you know we actually produce like like per capita um at least we did at that time um a higher percentage of of university graduates than um than anywhere else which is a funny statistic because uh for different reasons uh but culturally it was very ingrained to like once once the ability to go to school arrived through student loans and things um uh, especially th through St. Nevex, even though I went to Mount A, but, but that became a big part of, of the culture mm -hmm. um, to, to, to go there. Uh, and this, this like, um, that has a lot to do, I think, with like the work of people like Moses Cody and, and like the Anakinish movement and all of this, uh, which like uh, it was all about like educating the working class and and there's a religious element to it as well, yeah. But but like lifting lifting the working class and 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 power through education. But there was also a, a misunderstanding about it in that like there you thought that like education would no of, of no matter what it would be would would give you a job, which was uh, uh, not not true, you know. Mm -hmm. um that like uh um it ended up not being true mm -hmm. uh all of my my aunts and uncles who are younger got university degrees my my parents didn't but then when student loans came into effect the younger ones all did um but not all of them got jobs you know that that were able to use it because the the uh um i think the understanding of like we can use this, uh, or how to use a university degree, what it, what it is useful for, was not applicable. 
you yeah. know, or, or you can use it to get a job, but then the job's not at home. Right. Like I think I'm thinking yeah. about, cause my aunts and uncles, so my, my grandparents, only one of them finished high school. Like most of my three to four of my grandparents left, I think before left at like grade six, grade nine and grade 11 or something like that. And mm-hmm. then my dad's mother, uh, went to normal college and became a teacher because that that's the one job, especially yeah. as a woman, that was like the one job that you could have in her era. Teaching nursing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nursing or religious life, in which case you probably also are a teacher or a nurse. Um, <laughs> um, but my, my mom and dad and all of their siblings got university degrees of some type, but then the ones that were able to use those degrees kind of in the field, for the most part, you couldn't work in Cape Breton. Like they all mm-hmm. sort of went down to Halifax. Yeah. Um, I guess the one really like off piece one is one of my dad's brothers went to the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, which is certainly not the kind of university education that people would normally be encouraging, I guess, but he made his career as a musician and that was kind of, I guess, I don't know, you can kind of do that in Cape Breton a little bit, but you're he's probably- the drummer? He's the drummer, yeah, yeah. Everybody loves him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the other famous name of my family is, I think he's won some East Coast music awards and whatever, and you know, he's done the whole bit. Um, But yeah, St. FX, it's funny you mentioned that because it's like, that's where my mom went, my dad went there and then and then left for a couple of years and then ended up going back to St. Mary's because by that point he and my mom were together and and wanted to be in Halifax for for both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's there's like this value placed on education that doesn't align necessarily with what education actually does. And I, yeah. I don't think it's like a bad, I think the notion of like enlightenment and lifting people up through education is, is a very noble one. But then that's not how, especially now, like that's not how universities really are structured and what they're realistically for, right? And like, you just kind of have to look at the way that they treat students essentially as as cash cows, particularly international students or anybody that's in a program where they can charge higher tuition. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's going on at CBU right now, but that's just because David Dingell is uh, is, uh, is interested in his own legacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, for for a lot of people going to university in these like rural areas, poorer areas, they're often the first one in their entire line, like genealogical, who are, who are going to university. That's that's true for me, my sisters. And, and so when you were the very first person going, like in, um, in your entire history of people, like the, there isn't an understanding of what it can achieve for you. There's, there's uh, uh, you know, your parents, my parents, a lot of people are like, that's what's going to get you out of uh, um, out of poverty, out of uh, uh, you won't have to work as hard as we did, that kind of thing. But but there's no notion of like what exactly it's going to get you and how. Only that university is the ticket. So so uh, you have no idea what you're doing at 17 when you pick your major. Uh, you'd have no idea. You're a child. Yeah. And, um, and so, so a lot of, a lot of people roll through from Cape Breton with their arts degrees and then they're like, what do I do with this? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> no, the answer is like, if you want to do something with that, you got to go back to school. Otherwise you can do the same job that you probably could have done anyway. And you could have gone to community college and gotten like a secretarial designation or something for a lot of years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, disappointing for everybody in the end, your parents were like, what was all that for? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You're the one told me to go. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And then you're, everyone's like, what? Um, but, uh, but you know, I, I, I didn't go to university. I probably wouldn't be doing what I do now. So I can't complain that much. It's no, just, I, can't, uh, I can't knock university, but it's, it, the yeah. value proposition has gotten a lot worse, I think, over the past. Uh, probably, I would say. Yes. And, and now like all of the, all of the faults are, are laid, laid more and more bare as, as we like, you can see them there. It used to be so hallowed and sort of secret. Now everybody's like looking, looking for, checking it out. You know, more and more people are going, right? So more and more people are getting exposed to just how, yeah. how little it does for some people. And again, like 
I, I, you know, I think I maybe would have benefited from taking time off before going to university, but like, I didn't know what else to do. Right. Like oh, you're a child. Cause you're a child. And I, I knew like any job that was going to hire me wasn't one that I was going to find particularly engaging. And so it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go to school and I, I don't want to do that in Halifax. I think there's things I need to do. I need to go away in order to grow up and figure out who I am. So I'm going to leave. And um, you'd, have, you'd have to work because otherwise like the only person who can go and grow and I mean, probably somebody with money who can go somewhere and and like spend money to grow. Like well, that's the thing, right? I, I didn't have like a trust fund of like, now I can go travel, right? So it's like, I'm going to take my student loans and the part of yeah. RESP that my parents put away for me and I'm going to go to school. And it was for the first couple of years, a total disaster. And you were 16? I was 16. I turned 17 oh. two months into my first year of undergrad. That is so young. That Yeah. Just a little baby. Well, and I, like at the time, and I think I was conscious of it at the time too, because I remember like I would kind of, I wouldn't go out of my way to lie about my age, but like it kind of came naturally because if you're in a social environment, especially if you're trying to go out, right? If you're trying to go to bars, you have to lie. Um, mm -hmm. But then also, you know, people quite rightly, if you're, you know, first year and you're 16 or 17, there's fourth year students who might be like 22, 23. I know when I was 22, I didn't want to be hanging around with any 17 year olds unless it was my younger siblings, right? So, you know, it's easy to be othered there. Yeah, well, and especially like you move somewhere, you're not from there and, and just all of these different things. So like at the time I knew it was weird and I knew that other people kind of might find it off putting, but then only when I got older, did I realize like, oh yeah, that was not amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know no one should have stopped me from doing it it was it was important to do I, I grew up a lot but um yeah I felt like just being from like a small town like I felt like a bumpkin so I, having even more things like the more things that that are piled on you uh like the harder it is I mean I don't know anybody who feels super comfortable going to university no in the first I think the people who feel super comfortable are like, I don't know if you're, I feel like it's the kind of archetypical like jock type people, like maybe yeah. in theory, some of those types feel comfortable. But even then I, I feel like no, right? Because you, unless you go to an incredibly small school from a very big high school or something like that, where, mm -hmm. you know, if you go to something like Mount A or, or St. FX, but you go to a high school that's several thousand students, maybe, you know, you go from being a big fish in a small pond to a medium fish in a small pond. And that maybe doesn't feel so bad, but for the most part, like if you're going to any sizable university or if you came from a small community or a small school or whatever, like you, you go from really knowing your way around and being kind of the, you know, pop dog. Nice thing oh, sorry. Nobody. <laughs> no, go for it. Oh, the nice thing about Mount Air was that it was full of, of liberal arts nerds so nobody had time for any anybody thought who thought they were cooler than anybody else mm -hmm. so any any kid who came in and thought they were hot shit everyone was like whatever <laughs> that that was nice like mm -hmm. if some, somebody came in and thought they were like super hot and like walked around like that everyone else was like <laughs> we don't care <laughs> Uh, I mean, the thing at, at some larger schools and U of T is kind of this way, like because it's so heavily a commuter school, if you are not a commuter and you live on residence, it becomes a lot of a smaller community very quickly. And so some people, and I, I was lucky enough to be one of these people because I know it's like not a universal experience. And some people I say, I had a good social experience at U of T and they're like, are you okay? Like, uh, are you well? <laughs> <laughs> I never been in a um, so I liked it. Oh my God. <laughs> that happened. I, I found the Jordan Peterson thing to be like a very good kind of shorthand explainer of like <laughs> that happened while I was a student there. And for a no. month, I had to, for a month, I had to walk by protests against him and counter protests supporting him for an entire month, like outside the building oh. where most of the sort of humanities and social science, like second year lectures would all be happening. Um, that's sick. <laughs> no, it's so terrible. So like Americans will try and, and bring up Jordan Peterson to me. I'm like, don't even talk about it. Like I've, I've been hearing about this 
since long before you've ever had to engage with it. I just, I just wanted to get a coffee and go to my class. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to, I was just trying to learn about like, I don't know, Plato's Republic, <laughs> you know. Just the basic shit. Yeah, the stuff that he says they're not teaching in schools anymore. I was trying to go to my lecture to learn about that. <laughs> and instead, you know, I do still enjoy memes about him. I will, I will say that. Ah, uh, yeah. I and you know, <laughs> and like, here's what I'll say: people, people say that you know the young leftist gender studies whatever students don't want to engage and whatever. And I read, I read his book. I read his book because I wanted to know what was in there. And you know. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it was, it was hard. A, a friend received it as a gag gift and then he read it and hated it. And he was like, you need to read this too so we can talk about it. <laughs> I'll wait for the uh, Books That Can Kill podcast episode about it. Maybe oh, I, I, they, they've got to do it. I've, I've started, yeah, I've started listening to that podcast recently and oh. really, I love it. <laughs> I'm very, like, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad episode, I think came out like today, the day that we're recording. And I'm very excited to hear that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tune in. And, yeah, I've only actually read one of the books. It was uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which I sort of read by accident because I, I picked it up cold in the in the airport and was like, this looks interesting. And then I started reading it and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, I've read, I'm trying to think. I don't, I think, I'm not sure if I've read any of them in full, but Clash of Civilizations, I did have to read excerpts of. Mm -hmm. Actually, in fact, when I was in high school, I went to a debate tournament one time where one of the topics that they gave us in advance of the tournament so we were supposed to prepare and like research and whatever was this house believes that we're living in a clash of civilizations or whatever so of course we're like okay what what's clash of civilizations like this seems like it's referring to something and, and we go and we find this book and I, we were reading it and we were just like this just seems like orientalism and islamophobia the book oh fun <laughs> That's well, because it's very like, you know, these civilizations have different inherent characters and in all of these things. Um, yeah. Then mysteriously, Japan is like a separate civilization from the entire rest of East Asia. But then all of Africa is like the same. Oh, I have not read that, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, uh... I, I gotta say, I, I lucked out in all of my, my courses in school. I, I never had to read a book where I was like, well, <laughs> I, I, uh, I never had to read a distasteful book. And, uh, and thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, you know, I've had to read certainly things that I didn't agree with in the course of doing mm -hmm. sexual diversity studies and gender studies. Cause I, I think that people have this- Oh, no doubt. Like, yeah you know, you're going to go and it's like indoctrination and it's all one viewpoint, which is like super not true, right? No, like, I think in gender studies, you have to read stuff that you disagree with in order to understand like the breadth of what. Well, yeah, exactly. And then, and then people assume that like all, you know, this is so like off piece, <laughs> but like, yeah, I know. I think that, you know, <laughs> In current discussions that we're seeing in the US, the UK, and to a lesser extent Canada, but it's coming here too about like, you know, restricting trans people's access to hormone replacement mm -hmm. therapy and specifically restricting kids' ability to social transition and stuff. Like, a lot of people that are advocating for those kinds of restrictions basically are like, oh, queer theory is like monolithic and they want to make people gay. It's like the theory of, of, causing people to adopt these deviant lifestyles. And it's just like super not true. I'm like, you can tell no. that people have read a book um <laughs> you know that or they've read books they've read books that they've read like completely the wrong books um they haven't even read the bible so yeah they just that, say they that's very true or they yeah they read the lines that get cherry picked out of it um but you know it's like there's actual diversity among queer theorists and they they have scraps like people in any other part of academia like you know we don't assume that all historians agree with each other about things in fact famously historians often disagree about their interpretation of stuff and they, they focus on different things it's the same in any field of inquiry so like I had to read things that I didn't necessarily agree with but that were valuable to me but that I, I didn't get like the ick I did get the ick from some political science texts <laughs> I'm sh I'm sure. I never took poli sci. I never took any of that. But uh, I I had I had a lot of friends who did. Now they're lawyers. <laughs> ah yes, I bet they are. 
I bet they yeah. are. Moni, Moni <laughs> produced a lot of lawyers, I will say. <laughs> do, they, do they all go to Dow like I was supposed to do? And then they go like, but yeah, you know, a number of them did. A number of them did go to Dow that, that like uh, a few years later, like, like you saw a lot of pictures pop up of like <laughs> everybody's getting called to the bar all of a sudden yeah yeah all the Dow stuff that was like I thought I'd be a shit lawyer it seems very boring see this is funny because I um there seem to be two camps when it comes to me there are people who really think I should go be a lawyer and think I'm making a huge mistake by not going to law school and then there are multiple people who have jumped for joy like in the air upon me saying that I deferred my offer and didn't go to law school in the end oh. um I mean I, I I love my lawyer friends, but when I look at the stuff they're reading sometimes, I'm like, oh, that's boring. Yeah, it, it's a lot of very dense, like a certain kind of language. And I think for some people, some people really love it. Like, that's what I'll say is people say yes. they're a happy lawyer, and that's not true. I know several. Um, but it's not for everybody. And to, to kind of circle back to, you know, earlier we were talking about like people who go back to school because they don't know what else to do and they're they're afraid. I think a lot of people you know, law is to a certain kind of person who maybe has a little bit more money, what teaching is to, you know, I suppose a certain generation that you were talking about of like, that's the mm -hmm. same career. Like if you go, you get that qualification, you have a job for life, which of course is not true in any industry. But yeah. it's, and that's what I get a lot from people who go to law school, not because they really want to be a lawyer, but just because they don't know what else to do. They're like, well, I could do a master's in, in something that I care about, or I could go to law school. If I do a master's, I have no job. If I go to law school, I probably have a job. I guess I'll go be a lawyer. Yes, I, I understand that line of thinking. I, I have a question that's unrelated to all that though. Have you ever thought about writing comics? Um, I can't draw. <laughs> so, no, so writing, writing. Writing, Um, not really, I guess like, not because I wouldn't want to do it, but just it's not something that would have ever occurred to me to do. Hmm. Yeah. But you, you, you were saying that like you, you think you're more well read in comics than the average person, but you wouldn't consider yourself well read in comics. I wouldn't consider myself well read in general, mm. actually. Um, and I, I know that that's like not that's objectively probably not true, but I, I think. You Sorry, I've heard you talk about certain comics and I, I feel like I feel like maybe you are are more well read in comics than you than you think you are, but uh just, guess, just from passing comments that you've made, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean I don't think I've read super broadly. Um I did do a course actually when I was in school oh. on on comics. It was the feminist graphic novel. I took it in my last year of undergrad. Um and it was a great course. And so I think that some of maybe why it seems like I'm well read is because we had to learn certain aspects of terminology and like learn how to read comics as opposed to how to read a prose book, which is one thing that when I was doing Canda Reads and people were like, I don't know, people get confused. What's the order of the panels? I don't know how to read it. It's like, okay, well, it's, it's not hard. It's just different, right? <laughs> you know, if we're reading comics that are in English and it's not manga, it's left to right, top to bottom, same as any other book. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. But they were like, I can't remember the characters, like, because you read it in four hours. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's like, also, I forget names of characters in prose books all the time. If it's a book that has a lot of characters, I guarantee I will not remember the name of every character unless I make No, it's true. And, and like, there, I read comics very fast as well. And, and I have to refer back on things to, to recall uh names and and everything because because if i'm enjoying it i'm just like mm -hmm. um and uh and then I, in order to do it, it justice i have to like be like no slow down like yeah. like like stop it and like look back at this thing uh because i will get ahead of myself but mm -hmm. but if you're not familiar with reading comments then you you might not even notice how how like fast you're going or or how how little information you're retaining but you're just looking at text right you're only looking at maybe like a, a tenth of the, the page right you wouldn't read a prose book and only read a tenth of the words that's true and you might not even know what you're doing in that sense um but uh but listening to you talk about things and uh, well if 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 a lot of your your experience comes from a from a course maybe 
Uh, but but I was like, I bet you'd make a, a Cracker Jack book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think writing is like, they, 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 yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I, I feel like I'll write some something in some format at some point eventually. That's something that, you know, it's like difficult. I think I would have never attempted to make any kind of career in writing if I didn't um, win several hundred thousand dollars on a game show because it kind of requires, like you either have to do other jobs on top of writing in order to kind of give yourself the financial latitude to just kind of be pitching and, and be figuring things out or you have to have money from your parents or, or something. Like there, there's, it's very difficult to kind of break in I think doing really anything as a writer, it seems to me from the outside. And that's true, yeah. like journalism, whether it's being a novelist, whether it's doing comics, whether it's doing like nonfiction, more mm -hmm. research-based writing, essays, anything. And so for me, as somebody who I think really had it like hammered into me growing up and not, you know, not for a bad reason, like you want to look for something that's stable and is going to sustain you. It was just kind of like not something that I thought was that good of an idea to do that yes and no I feel like uh um that was also the message I got but uh I'm doing it anyway um, <laughs> <laughs> I also think that um once you are established as an as in it, like a media personality as as a, a well-known that that is already your your foot in the door so mm -hmm. so um, uh, you, you are not a nobody if you were interested in writing, but, but I don't know if writing, not just comments, but I don't know if writing is something that you were interested in anyway. So you, you've got no, a lot of, I mean, I think I, I think I am. I think it's, there's, there's also weird, like, I realize I'm very lucky to be in a position where I do kind of have doors that are open for me <laughs> that you're having to beat the door down to get it to. Yeah to open a, a you know maybe it opens a crack and then it gets slammed back in your face a certain yeah matter. yeah and you wouldn't want you wouldn't want it just to you wouldn't want it just to be open and then not be like well am I good enough there, well exactly right it's because yeah. that's that's the thing it's like people right I've realized the more books I read the more I realize that some of them are not very good <laughs> no you don't want to be that either I I struggle with that as well I if, if you talk to my husband, this is happening in our house all the time right now. I'm like, what am I going to follow this book up with now? Like I have different things, different ideas on the go, but every day I, I sort of like, it's almost like I follow this up. And what am I, uh, because whatever I do next uh, will be published, but um, will it be, will it be good enough to follow this book? Because this book is getting such a claim and, uh, and whatever it will be, it's not sophomore, but it will be like a sophomore slump no matter what it is, because this one has hit such heights. And, and I need to be prepared for that. Um, and so I may as well do what I want to do without having any kind of um, hopes for it in a sense, um, except for that I, to, to do, uh, uh, what I feel like in the moment, um, you know, I, not to be like, just put any old shit out there. <laughs> but, yeah. But, uh, um, uh, you know, trusting myself and, and, and what I want, but, but not, not hoping or trying to emulate the success uh, that, that this book has had, if that makes sense. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's like, there are certain sayings that are like trite sayings for a reason, because there is some truth to them. Right. And I think that the idea of like doing work because you want to do it and telling the stories that you want to tell, because at the end of the day, whether or not, whether or not something resonates with an audience is not entirely up to you. Right. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. You can certainly try your best to present things in a way that people are going to respond to you. But at the end of the day, like you know, kind of different, but it's like, I look at, for instance, and I, I'm so bad for like reading comments about things that I do. I really, I will go in my, through my Twitter mentions and I'm on, I'm on r slash Jeopardy reading r slash Jeopardy, people making all kinds of ridiculous insinuations about why I behave in the way that I do. 
Uh, and like, I see just the craziest misinterpretations of things that I think I'm being incredibly clear and coming across like, like so clearly, I, you know, I say what I mean, whatever. And, and people will still find ways to, and it's not always in a bad way, but people will have their own interpretation of things that is completely just out of your hands. Whether you're writing, whether you're, you know, somebody who I, I very deliberately try to like avoid doing influencer things just because it makes me feel uh, unwell. Um, but, you know, if you're somebody whose personality and, and your essence as a person is a big part of what you put forward, people are going to misinterpret facts about you. Um, okay. Right. Like. And there's just kind of not that much you can do about it. So then at that point, like, why not just do work that you enjoy, that you mm -hmm. think good and damn whether like reviewers think it's good or whether it's yeah. like the best thing that you've ever done. Yeah, I, I, I think that what I do next will be sort of like what I, um, uh, what I feel like is best for me. And, and if it, if people respond to it, then I will be elated. Um, and, uh, um, but, but if I like, if I go into it being like, I need to make a bestseller, then it will absolutely fall on its face because, because if that's your attitude, then I think that uh, people will see right through it. You know, it will be, uh, it, it will feel like that. It will feel cheap. Mm -hmm. You can, I think movies are like the the place where that's the most obvious of like when movies get hyped up of like, this is going to be, you know, the Oscar bait movie or the the box office smash hit movie. Yes. And yeah. They end up not doing that well or not getting many awards like I, I don't know but Babylon like the new Damien Chazelle movie came out last year I haven't seen it so I can't comment on its quality mm -hmm. as a movie but a lot of how it was marketed I don't know Margot Robbie was in it it was like old Hollywood it was the sort of thing that I should have wanted to watch yeah but it so much like this is Damien Chazelle's project after La La Land and it's going to be big mm -hmm. and it's going to be expensive looking and it's going to have all this star power behind it and it's going to be this love letter to the movies in this era and then nobody <laughs> wanted to see it it like did not do uh, well box office <laughs> yeah yeah you don't want that and and a big follow-up i know i know um anyways we'll figure it out you'll something will like something will get published by me in a couple of years and you'll be like what's this yeah <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows i'm wondering yeah. how much we have there we we have a um uh there was a thing that came up and said a few minutes but i, I don't know how long ago that was i think it was a few minutes a few minutes ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't this is the problem is like we we have this this is the same as when we did that like CBC interview thing right it's people are like yeah. oh, just talk talk and it's like they're like no problem I'm like oh talk I can do that all day like yes and there was a thing that came up earlier that was like a slide and I was like I want to go back to that slide but if I do if I do that then then we'll be like added for like ever but you're never gonna um, leave. it's like when, when you're trying to leave you're trying to leave somebody's house and it's like an hour of like oh goodbye now oh but one more thing and another thing i know that's like when my relatives are here and they're like no stay no you got lots of time and then they're like inching away towards the door but they're like another cup of tea and they're like oh another cup of tea <laughs> yeah 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 but there's <laughs> somebody who's got a do you want a slice of pie do you want yes. you know oh but now now, now it's almost lunchtime. so so won't you stay for lunch we have leftover roast or something like <laughs> yes and they're like sitting down you know like uh oh if i go to visit my mom's house in the summertime and more people keep coming in and then you can't leave because it's rude. <laughs> and someone up. So it's the rotating revolving door cast of characters. Well, and it's yeah. bad for me when I typically when I go see my grandparents, it's usually just my mom and I will go together um, and we'll go, you know, once we even drove from Halifax to Inganish and back in the same day, we left at like seven in the morning, got there around noon, stayed for a couple hours and then went back. Um, but it's like, you know, because we're in from away, people will want to come from down the road and this and that and come in and, oh, see, you know, Matea's back from Toronto. <laughs> yeah. <It's laughs> here. But then they, they don't come here, So it's not all at the same time. No, no. My mom's family comes in from Ontario. So like, and they're here for days and days. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> just like endless cups of tea and and like roasts and barbecues and whatever the else is going on and you're just like I cannot drink any more tea <laughs> no, no I can only take some food. It's like red rose tea with a lot of milk like there's only yes. so much red rose tea with a lot of milk that I can drink <laughs> the orange pico or king cole yeah, yeah. Uh, I made that joke uh on uh I drew it out but like I had um Barack Obama had had like uh put my book on his list and um and he was like uh he was like uh, that my book was like on his favorite list or whatever and then uh so I came to mom and dad's and I was like I was on Barack's list and they're like wow but in the flyer King Cold Tea was on sale and they were like 166 bags a box and it's six dollars and everybody was calling each other about it they were like at the superstore <laughs> this is like okay you know what this reminds me of <laughs> I think it was like I think it was May, 2021. It was, it was like relatively, it was COVID spring, not sure what year. There was a sale on Birkenstocks at Costco in Halifax and Stephen McNeil did the press conference where he was like, don't be going to buy the Birkenstocks that are on sale at Costco. Cause people were calling each other about it. It was like the talk of the town. There was a meme of, of like, somebody made it and that was going around it was like no and a picture of like the Birkenstocks <laughs> the Birkenstocks and it was Stephen McNeil and Robert Strang like don't be going to buy the Birkenstocks at Costco they'll still be there next week like don't yes. go <laughs> Dr. Strang's brother lives in Mabel or like his half brother or something and that was our claim to fame during that thing as well Dr. Strang is was our if you don't know he was our COVID doctor so <laughs> yeah <laughs> his brother drive around with an excavator digging holes in his backyard so we're like what happened there <laughs> yeah I don't like that <laughs> I don't like that <laughs> uh, I don't have a positive association with people digging a lot of holes in their backyard like he's, <laughs> I'm sure yeah, he's fine he's, bored. he's just he just uses his excavator and digs holes all day and you're like can he do this is weird yeah. just, personal sandbox anyway everybody always has a connection somewhere you know thing i saw a thing on like uh like i don't know when it was but it was like is megan markle a cape Bretoner? <laughs> like, <laughs> no no she's not no, no but oh, brendan, fraser, brendan, brendan fraser won the oscar and everyone's like his dad's from new waterford <laughs> like you can't escape Cape Breton like if your great-grandfather or whatever was from here then then like they claim you and so he won the Oscar and someone wrote a big thing with like a genealogical tree yeah. with like showing how they were related to Brendan Fraser because his dad is like a Fraser from New Waterford and they're like his dad is this like John Fraser from this place and that's how we're cousins <laughs> and, that's how we're, and that's how we're cousins. Everybody's yeah. cousins. I remember I did an interview on like Information Morning Cape Breton about a year ago. And one of my, my mom's cousin, I think it was, had had like a watch party for one of my Jeopardy episodes at a like a sports bar in Sydney. And the poor interviewer was like trying to figure out how this guy was related to me, you know, your cousins, but like, what kind of cousin are you? And my, my, my poor cousin was just like the best kind of cousin. Like he, he couldn't say like, you know, they were looking for like second cousin, first cousin once removed, something like that. And he just goes, the best cousin. <laughs> um, I don't know how I'm related to some of my cousins. So I just know that we are, and we're like our cousin. They're like, yeah. there's, there's like the family tree is like, the, like the DNA is like, blah. it's just yeah. too, it's like it's, too. I'll know who kind of the close relative is in terms of like whether it's like okay this is you know my one of my grandmother's niece and nephew or something like this is the other problem too is like I'm not sure if this is the case in your family but like my on both sides of my family like my grandparents all had just so many siblings right because that was you used yes. to have a ton of kids and yeah. so you know my parents have all these aunts and uncles and just as well like because you like, like, I don't know, my mom has, has aunts that are like only a couple years older than her that are the same age as her brothers. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and so the kind of like family tree, you know, I have these people that are my, my cousins or my first cousin once removed or, or whatever, but then they're like way older than me, 
but that's my cousin still somehow it gets confusing yes. very quickly yes yes it does um I have like especially around here like some of like the earliest like settlers and stuff there weren't that many of them so like some of like the same names show up in the family when you get back like 10 generations and you're like oh no I don't like that <laughs> I'm gonna look away I don't like that yeah uh, and then so you're like you're looking at like we did our family trees in grade 11 and then everyone was like everyone was looking around they were like <laughs> at the other kids were like none of us can get married yeah <laughs> It's like how in uh, in Iceland they somebody made like an app for this. It's like a dating. Oh, oh so that they can't get, so that they, they don't you don't end up hooking up with somebody who's like your second cousin and you don't know. <laughs> like, oh fuck! I would never date anyone from Apple. Um. Anyway, I will. Uh, I will tell you this also before we go. Uh, about going in here, or when you were on TV, mm -hmm. I this is maybe the greatest compliment. Um, I was visiting somebody in Malibu like like these these old neighbors right and uh you're, you were about to come on on jeopardy and uh and i was talking to one of them like in mid-sentence i was like hello daniel like how's it going he's like very good blah 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 blah. and he's like he has like his cup of tea he's like blah, 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 blah. and then like you came on and he turned away from me mid-sentence and just went <laughs> volume up <laughs> So that you drowned out everything, like like Jeopardy just drowned out everybody in the room, and we were like, <laughs> the volume <laughs> that people put it on in their house is truly something else. Like, because they're I, all deaf. <laughs> yeah, I watched one episode with my grandparents. It was my second last one, and I didn't plan this on purpose, but it happened to be the one where I mentioned because like you start to run real thin on the stories the further along you go. Like you, the people only have so many good like thirty second stories that are appropriate. Mm. You can really tell. And so I was just like, you know, uh, one of the questions, they're like, what's, what's the favorite, favorite place of yours or whatever. So I talked about Ingedish in, in that day, but just, yeah, watching with my grandparents, um, absolute ear splitting volume, and then it'll go to commercial and everyone's like, ah, because the commercial of course is twice as loud as the show. Yes, it is. yes. yes. Uh, but, but I, I was actually okay with him doing it. It was just very funny. I was like, whoa, whoa, harsh. He's like, volume. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I think we are out of time now. I think we went way over, but that's uh, that's what you get when you put two East Coasters in the room. It's true. It's true. With a cup of tea, and yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was a pleasure as always, as always. And uh, and thank you once again for for everything you did on Canada Reads. It was it was wonderful. Thank you. It's been it's been a lot of fun and it's been a treat getting to know you and have some have some good chats <laughs> as a result. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Um and hopefully we'll we'll see you on the island. Yeah, hopefully. Okay.